The Daughter of the Great Mogul by Daniel Defoe Reading from Great Pirate Stories by Joseph Lewis French As read to you by me, Mars In this time I pursued my voyage, coasted the whole Malabar shore, and met with no purchase but a great Portugal East India ship, which I chased into Goa, where she got out of my reach. I took several small vessels and barks, but little of value in them, till I entered the great Bay of Bengal, when I began to look about me with more expectation of success, though without prospect of what happened. I cruised here about two months, finding nothing worthwhile, so I stood away to a port on the north point of the Isle of Sumatra, where I made no stay, for here I got news that two large ships belonging to the Great Mogul were expected to cross the bay from Hoogli in the Ganges to the country of the King of Pegu, being to carry the granddaughter of the Great Mogul to Pegu, who is to be married to the King of that country, with all her retinue, jewels, and wealth. This was a booty worth watching for, though it had been some months longer, so I resolved that we would go and cruise off Port Nagaris on the east side of the bay near Diamond Isle. And here we plied off and on for three weeks and began to despair of success, but the knowledge of the booty we expected spurred us on, and we waited with great patience, for we knew the prize would be immensely rich. At length we spied three ships coming right up to us with the wind. We could easily see they were not Europeans by their sails, and began to prepare ourselves for a prize, not for a fight. But were a little disappointed when we found the first ship full of guns and full of soldiers, and in condition, had she been managed by English sailors, to have fought two such ships as ours were. However, we resolved to attack her if she had been full of devils as she was full of men. Accordingly, when we came near them, we fired a gun with shot as a challenge. They fired again immediately three or four guns, but fired them so confusedly that we could easily see they did not understand their business. When we considered how to lay them on board, and so to come thwart them, if we could, but falling for want of wind open to them, we gave them a fair broadside. We could easily see by the confusion that was on board that they were frightened out of their wits. They fired here a gun and there a gun, and some on that side that was from us as well as those that were next to us. The next thing we did was to lay them on board, which we did presently, and then gave them a volley of our small shot, which, as they stood so thick, killed a great many of them, and made all the rest run down under their hatches, crying out like creatures bewitched. In a word, we presently took the ship, and having secured her men, we chased the other two. One was chiefly filled with women, and the other with lumber. Upon the whole, as the granddaughter of the great Mogul was our prize in the first ship, so in the second was her women, or, in a word, her household, her eunuchs, all the necessaries of her wardrobe, of her stables, and of her kitchen, and in the last great quantities of household stuff, and things less costly, though not less useful. But the first was the main prize. When my men had entered and mastered the ship, one of our lieutenants called for me, and accordingly I jumped on board. He told me he thought nobody but I ought to go into the great cabin, or at least nobody should go there before me, for that the lady herself and all her attendants was there, and he feared the men were so heated they would murder them all, or do worse. I immediately went to the great cabin door, taking the lieutenant that called me along with me, and caused the cabin door to be opened. But such a sight of glory and misery was never seen by Buccaneer before. The queen, for such she was to have been, was all in gold and silver, but frightened and crying, and at the sight of me she appeared trembling, and just as if she was going to die. She sat on the side of a kind of a bed like a couch, with no canopy over it, or any covering, only made to lie down upon. She was in a manner covered with diamonds, and I, like a true pirate, soon let her see that I had more mind to the jewels than to the lady. 
However, before I touched her, I ordered the lieutenant to place a guard at the cabin door and fastening the door shut us both in, which he did. The lady was young, and I suppose, in their country esteem, very handsome, but she was not very much so in my thoughts. At first, her fright and the danger she thought she was in of being killed taught her to do everything that she might thought interpose between her and danger, and that was to take off her jewels as fast as she could and give them to me, and I, without any great compliment, took them as fast as she gave them me and put them in my pocket, taking no great notice of them, or of her, which frighted her worse than all the rest, and she said something which I could not understand. However, two of the other ladies came, all crying, and kneeled down to me with their hands lifted up. What they meant I knew not at first, but by their gestures and pointings, I found at last it was to beg the young queen's life, and that I would not kill her. When the three ladies kneeled down to me, and as soon as I understood what it was for, I let them know I would not hurt the queen, nor let anyone else hurt her, but that she must give me all her jewels and money. Upon this they acquainted her that I would save her life, and no sooner had they assured her of that, but she got up smiling, and went to a fine Indian cabinet, and opened a private drawer, from whence she took another little thing full of little square drawers and holes. This she brings to me in her hand, and offered to kneel down to give it to me. This innocent usage began to rouse some good nature in me, though I never had much, and I would not let her kneel. But sitting down myself on the side of her couch or bed, made a motion to her to sit down too. But here she was frightened again, it seems, at what I had no thought of. But as I did not offer anything of that kind, only made her sit down by me, they began all to be easier after some time, and she gave me the little box or casket, I know not what to call it, but it was full of invaluable jewels. I gave them still in my keeping, and wish they were safe in England, for I doubt not but some of them are fit to be placed on the king's crown. Being master of this treasure, I was very willing to be good-humoured to the persons, so I went out of the cabin and caused the women to be left alone, causing the guard to be kept still, that they might receive no more injury than I would do them myself. After I had been out of the cabin some time, a slave of the women's came to me, and made sign to me that the queen would speak with me again. I made signs back that I would come and dine with her majesty, and accordingly I ordered that her servants should prepare her dinner, and carry it in, and then call me. They provided her repast after the usual manner, and when she saw it brought in she appeared pleased, and more when she saw me come in after it, for she was exceedingly pleased that I had caused a guard to keep the rest of my men from her and she had, it seems, been told how rude they had been to some of the women that belonged to her. When I came in, she rose up, and paid me such respect as I did not well know how to receive, and not in the least how to return. If she had understood English, I could have said plainly and in good rough words, Madam, be easy. We are rude, rough-hewn fellows, but none of our men should hurt you, or touch you. I will be your guard and protection. We are for money indeed, and we shall take what you have, but we will do you no other harm. But as I could not talk thus to her, I scarce knew what to say, but I sat down and made signs to have her sit down and eat, which she did, but with so much ceremony that I did not know well what to do with it. After we had eaten, she rose up again, and drinking some water out of a china cup, sat her down on the side of the couch as before. When she saw it had done eating, she went then to another cabinet, and pulling out a drawer she brought it to me. It was full of small pieces of gold coin of Pegu, about as big as an English half-guinea, and I think there were three thousand of them. She opened several other drawers, and showed me the wealth that was in them, and then gave me the key of the whole. We had reveled thus all day, and part of the next day, in a bottomless sea of riches. When my lieutenant began to tell me, we must consider what to do with our prisoners and the ships, for that there was no subsisting in that manner. Upon this we called a short council, 
and concluded to carry the great ship away with us, but to put all the prisoners, queen, ladies, and all the rest into the lesser vessels, and let them go. And so far was I from ravishing this lady, as I hear is reported of me, that though I might rifle her of everything else, yet I assure you, I let her go untouched for me, or as I am satisfied, for any one of my men. Nay, when we dismissed them, we gave her leave to take a great many things of value with her, which she would have been plundered of if I had not been so careful of her. We had now wealth enough not only to make us rich, but almost to have made a nation rich. And to tell you the truth, considering the costly things we took here, which we did not know the value of, and besides gold and silver and jewels, I say we never knew how rich we were, besides which we had a great quantity of bales and of goods, as well calicoes as wrought silks, which being for sake, no, which being for sale, or perhaps as a cargo of goods to answer the bills which might be drawn upon them for the account of the bride's portion, all which fell into our hands, with a great sum in silver coin too big to talk of among Englishmen, especially while I am living for reasons which I may give you hereafter. The End That was pretty cool.